All right. Good morning, everyone. So today, um, I'm just going to show you very, something very, very, very simple. Um, it's very simple, but a few days ago, someone asked me how to do it. You know, someone asked me how to do it, and I realized that a few people may not know exactly how to get this done in their environment. Uh, I used to do this long ago, but I mean, I, I, I still realize that people still need to find out or need to know how to get this done. What it is, is a scenario where someone gives you a backup set uh, that is from another, that was uh, generated on another system. What this means is that someone somewhere else outside your environment took a backup of a database and you need to bring it into your environment and restore it there. It also could be that um, you took the backup on another server with a different um, operating system file structure, and you need to essentially restore it to another instance of SQL Server, um, you know, and, and lay out the data files in a new file structure. So I want you to stick around till the end. At the end of it, I also share some personal views around the uh, dilemma of remaining a turkey versus moving on to other stuff. So here, this is my instance. Uh, this is an instance of SQL Server 2017 that I installed um, just yesterday on my laptop. I typically would use a cloud instance, but uh, I just happened to install this yesterday. Um, you know, on my laptop, it's SQL Server 2017, SQL Server 14. This is the build number, but, but the version is SQL Server 2017. And uh, probably just in case you didn't know how to get uh, that, select um, at, at version. Yeah, that's it. So that gives you the, the, the version of this instance right here. So this is SQL Server 2017. There's been no patches. So this is the, you know, the base edition with the version number detailed there. Okay, so what uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to be looking at this wide world importance. The reason why you see it here is because it's, um, it was, already, I, I did a, a, the first iteration yesterday, but today I'm just going to do exactly what I did from yesterday over again using uh, these three basic statements. This is number one here, maybe I should call it Maybe I should call it listing one, then listing two, and, and uh, listing three. Sorry about that. So, so these are the only scripts you need to get uh, this movement done. So essentially what you're doing is using the backup and restore approach to migrate a database from one uh, server to another, from one site to another, from one company to another. And uh, in the case of this particular backup set, I just picked it up from the um, Microsoft website. This is the sample database, the more recent sample database, wide world importance, full backup set. So I'm going to restore it to this, my instance that is sitting on my um, computer. And you will realize that my computer has its own direct, uh, you know, um, file structure, files, you know, the file system structure, the directory structure, it which may not be the same. I mean, all the all the volumes that I have here is not; they are not likely to be the same as where this backup set was taken. So the first thing I want to find out a little bit about this backup set. So I'm going to use the restore header only from disk. Uh, statement executed, and it's going to tell me a few things about this backup set. First of all, the backup name is uh, was was the backup was assigned a name, which means when the backup was being taken. Uh, if you've looked at previous lectures around taking backups, you discover that you can use a with option that appends a name, a logical identification to that backup. So it was appended; it was given a name in during the backup. Um, there was no description uh, specified. It's backup type one, which is a full backup. It's actually compressed, right? And this is the first file in the backup set. Again, there is a whole article around being able to identify files within the backup set. 
device type two disk, I believe. Uh, you can check up that. And who took this backup? I can actually tell who took this backup. Uh, his name is what? Uh, his name is 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 P uh, S. PES count. Uh, I mean, maybe that's someone's name, or maybe it's just a um, an, an identity that is used for these kinds of things. It was taken at Renmon. This is Microsoft, and it also tells me the server where this backup was taken, desktop, G, FGUP, and so forth. The database name. Recall that the database name differs from the backup name. Very important, right? As the database name. So I'm going to use this database name, assuming. I don't even know the database name. I can actually get it from the backup set and use the same name in my restore statement. Okay, what's the database version? That is also indicated. And I'll show you a little bit about that when the restore is done. When the backup was done, the backup, the database was created in 2022, right? The size of the backup, um, you can tell that as well. Now this size is typically in, in bytes or uh, in KB. Uh, we have to check that, but that's not the focus of today's conversation. So I will not show you that today. And then the uh, the logical sequence number where the where the backup um, um, you know basically started in the uh, based on the uh, you know a, a state in this transaction log where it started, where the, the sequence number, the, the restore point you can guarantee and the last uh, the logical sequence number as well. So this is all detailed here. When the, how long the backup took? Basically, backup start date is um, 7th of October, 2022 at 14.21. And it finished at 7th of October, 2022 at 14.21.58. It took about, uh, that's about one second. That was a very short time, I think. Okay, excuse me. All right, so we... That's, that's been getting most of the information. You can go on and on and on and get a, a few things here. It even tells us, it even tells us the recovery model that of the original database where the backup set was taken and so forth. All right, so that's a restore header only from disk. I'm also going to do another statement that says restore file list only from disk. So what this gives me is the list of logical files that are that were part of the database at the time it was live. It also shows me what uh, directory paths these logical files were sitting in at the original database before they were taken. So that means that I can identify the logical file names and I can now use it in my restore statement to do the restore and push the physical file to a directory that I choose, to a path, a folder that I choose, right? It also tells me what the file groups are and so forth, the typical size. Now, if, if you have size constraints, you may want to check this out. You may want to check this out to really determine um, um, what, what space requirement you need to check. Uh, calc, let me, one gig actually. That's about one gig. So all I had to do was divide this by, this is, this is in bytes divided by 1024 times three, right? And, and I get one gig. This is about two gig and so forth. So um, that gives you an idea of how much space to make available on your uh, destination directory. So once I have the, uh, this, this, this um, result set actually gives us a lot more stuff, which probably uh, I will not go into, but, but take, a, take a look at this. Even the backup size is given. So you see that there is that compression uh, of the files when the backup is taken. All right, so I'm going to move my um, the first logical file, wwi underscore primary, to a path on my computer called uh, the uh, slash data. I'm going to maintain the names of my, um, of my physical data files. So what I typically did was something like this, right? I just took this out, right? This is out, right? I took my restore statement. Uh, restore statement here, and then I do the move thing. So I can just do move here. I hold down my Alt button on my keyboard, and I say with move. Then I want to. These are these are those where the file name, the logical file name to go. Then I move to the disk, right? 
Right, that's it. Close up this and include my commas. Close up this and include my commas. Close up this, include my commas, close up this, all right? Now I'm gonna change the path. So I just take the path here. I take away everything from here. We delete all the way up to here, right? Slash data. Now, if I wanna move uh, the log file to a log directory, all I have to do is to change this. This is cool. Then I add the recovery statement as well. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the option, the, the, the recovery to, to recover the database after the restore is done. Okay, so this is my statement and I run it. The stats uh, um, um, argument or clause uh, tells the um, engine that I want you to show me how the progress. I can decide to do this progress as uh, every, every 10%, 50% or 1%, maybe for it to show up more, I can do five, right? And then I include all the logical files that I have listed from my query or interrogation of the data and the backup set, okay? So I then execute, I'm gonna execute, okay. All right, so uh, I like the fact that this error came up because it's an important thing to learn from. Because I already have this database, I did it before. It says restore cannot process database. Why wouldn't it process? Because it is in used by this session. So all I have to do is to switch uh, the database context and say use master go, right? So that I do the restore. I could get another error about uh, conflicting files. So, um, okay, sorry, that, that, that was a mistake here. So let's go back to the file list only. I have user data twice, so this should be log. So the logical file name should go to its own physical file. Again, and the messages begin to pour out. Uh, if it's not able to lock the database, then likely it will also return an error. If it's taking this amount of time, it's probably not able to lock the database, right? So I'm just going, I'm also going to probably add a replace statement. Yes, exclusive access could not be obtained because the database is in use. I can do a replace statement um, to simply just knock it out or I could uh, close the database uh, wherever session, maybe I have another session that is connected. I just stop the um, you know connections, but I can show you that in another session. Tell me in the comments if you want me to expand on some of these concepts I'm mentioning. So if I do a replace, I should be able to knock it out. If I don't, I'm not able to knock it out with that replace statement, then what I'm going to do, I'm going to close all the sessions, alter database, um, and, and basically close all the sessions that are there. So let me take a look at that. Again, taking too long. So I'm just going to open another session here. Alter database wide world importers set offline with row back immediate. Recall that I could simply just, um, you know, delete the database, right? But you see, uh, I I'm just trying to show a, a few techniques that you might face in real life, yeah? yeah, I mean, if you need to basically take hold of a database. So I could do that in the back online. So by doing this statement, I basically, um, I basically knocked off all the sessions that are holding onto that DB. And then I'm gonna try the restore statement again to override the database. And yeah, and it's done. Every 5%, it shows me the progress. It, it does uh, tells me how many pages uh, were, uh, were were you know written in this database uh, 1464 pages each page in SQL server typically translates to about 8 KB right and I've, I've covered that in a whole different lecture around this physical structure of databases 
So if you multiply this by ITKB, you, you should get back the size, the total size of this data file, remember, all right? Then uh, because this database was probably backed up at the, in a lower version of SQL Server, the recovery process upgrades up till the current version of the instance um, as well. And, and that is done. So thank you for hanging out with me this morning. Um, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen, bring up my video and you know talk about talk a little bit about something that I think is a bonus for for you if if you are interested in in this kind of uh, conversation. So I'm going to turn on my video right now. Now, I, I spent uh, about seven years of my career doing SQL Server databases, and uh, I know a lot of things like the back of my hand, but at a point I began to question why, um, what is the next phase? What's the next for me as a person, as a professional? I could decide to continue being an expert in, in SQL Server, dig deeper, go for conferences, become an, maybe an MVP. Many people are doing that successfully in their careers. But I also began to brainstorm on the uh, likely outcomes of that path. Am I going to be a techie forever? I also looked at the growth path of a lot of my seniors, both who are leading, and I made a choice. I made a choice that I wanted to do something different. I switched to enterprise architecture. And out of the, that thinking, I built a, my own concept around career growth. And that's why I have a Udemy course called Career Growth Strategies in Information Technology. A person who has my background could decide to remain a techie uh, and grow in that path, depending on their context, right? He could also decide to become a manager and lead people if he has capacity to do that. He also decide to morph into another area of IT, service management, enterprise uh, architecture, you know, project management, ETC, another path that allows him to broaden is thinking around how IT works. So I don't know where you are in your journey, but um, taking my course you'd, on Udemy, uh, Career Growth Strategies in Information Technology might be useful to you. So check it out. Just Google my name, Kenneth Figiri, and you will find the course on Udemy. I hope you enjoyed this if you're a DBA, and I hope you're also able to chart your own path to growth in your career. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day.